Robert, you come to Strasbourg for the first time and uh, with a great feature film called The Man Who Shot Hitler and Dan Bigfoot. Uh, thank you and welcome to Strasbourg first. Thank you for having me. Um, this movie is about the iconic figure of the American hero. Uh, you always had a sommelier in mind. We had more of an idea of uh, a type, uh, this kind of stoic Norman Rockwell archetype of an American. And the more we thought about who would kind of embody that, the more it gravitated to somebody like Sam. And then when Sam ultimately agreed to do the movie and we saw him in costume and you know the, the costume designer and the production designer, we were all trying to get this kind of Norman Rockwell vibe. He, he really embodied that. So it, it wasn't so much that we had a bunch of people in mind. It was who could, who could embody this, this guy. It was Sam. It was Sam. And uh, he's, he, he did many of that kind of roles. And the first scene with him in the movie is sitting on, at the bar. Mm -hmm. Of course, the audience will recall The Big Lebowski. Yeah. You had this in mind? As a I, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't intended, but yeah. as we were shooting it, yeah. and I saw Sam, he, was, he, was, he, he, he had this big smile. Somebody said something. It was, we weren't even shooting, and I had this realization. I was like, what is this reminding me of? And I thought, it's the, he's sitting at the bar. It's like The Big Lebowski. I'm sitting there. So they're, they're spiritually connected in some weird way. So, yeah. It's a, it's a challenge for a young director to do a film on uh, various time scales because it's a movie set in the past and in present at the same time. Yeah. Uh, when you pitched the project, was it a big problem to imagine that it would, of course, cost a lot more? Yeah, it, it was convincing people that we would use the the, some of the old school techniques that we wound up using with Douglas Trumbull and Richard Urisich and the visual effects team, matte paintings and miniatures and um, things that could pull this movie off so it would still have a scope but be done on a smaller independent budget. So that was kind of the thing was convincing people it could be done for, for that. And then the, the time jumping was just a matter of getting it right in the script and committing to, to a flow to that, that that felt like it was organic and it wasn't jarring and jumping you from place to place. We wanted it to feel very elegant in the way that you're moving through time. And so in some ways it's like a time travel movie because each timeline is having a conversation with the other um, and, they're, and each one's affecting the other as the movie progresses. And so um, it was just a balance in the, in the writing. And once we felt that we had that, it was, I think okay to proceed, and people weren't so nervous about that aspect. They were nervous about how are you going to pull off World War II, and how you know how is Bigfoot not going to make people howl with laughter? And you know those were the the real tricks to convince people. Uh, the art direction is incredible. Yeah, yeah. Brett Hatcher is did beautiful work. And you are really attached to details. You know, it's and that's well, as they say, devils in details and yeah. great talents there. They, to, you, I remember the, the watch of the Nazi. Sure. It's an amazing idea. You had this idea as you wrote the script or did, did it come later? It was uh, early in the, in, the, in the script. I just thought if he looked at a watch and it had this ticking swastika, it can't even tell time. I thought it would be a fun way to let the audience know that it's okay to suspend your disbelief and kind of let this thing be its own weird thing. And, and so it was kind of a way of just winking at the audience and saying, we know this is a little weird, but we're with you and we're having fun and, and hopefully play with your perceptions as the movie progresses. And that was a weird thing to have to go to a jeweler and ask them to make us a watch with a ticking swastika because nobody wants to do that and have to explain what it's for. But they were game and they did it, and uh, it's just a it's just a totally weird gag that kind of opens opens the movie. But yeah, the, the that was all. I did uh, hundreds of storyboards for the film and conceptual designs so that the the crew could see very much what we were going to try to accomplish on any given day, and then working with the visual effects team and all. We were constantly discussing how we would pull this this stuff off. So and. Um, 
You did a great job finding an actor that played the character young. Yeah. Because he has the same type of voice mm -hmm. as Sam Elliott. Was yeah, he could have he gone even further with that. Mm -hmm. You know, he could really emulate Sam, but we felt like the audience might not like that as much if somebody's... It would feel almost like we were teasing Sam or we were being um, cute with it. And so we let Aiden kind of be Aiden just with an American accent rather than forcing it down into Sam's register. We wanted them to to feel connected through the very subtle details much more than trying to do a very broad impersonation of Sam. I just don't think that that would have been as satisfying. So we you know, talked a lot about that and Aiden I think does a really subtle version of Sam and then he's also kind of doing his own cool thing too. Did the movie always uh, have this title? Or it, yeah, because people must talk to you a lot about the title. It sure. kind of promises stuff yeah. that never really happened. No, I think, yeah. <laughs> I, I wrote the first 10 pages as kind of a James Bond opening. And when I got to the end of the 10 pages, we just killed Hitler. And where do you go after that? And I started thinking about, well, Hitler was a monster, so I'll have this hero fight another monster. And Hitler was spreading a plague of ideas, so Bigfoot would be spreading a literal plague. So I went back to the beginning and I wrote that title almost as a challenge to you know, bridge that with the rest of the script. Can I get to that title and can I earn it? And, and also just trying to do a character study in the middle of that where once you've put that title on the movie, you've let the audience know everything they need to know, so it has to be about something more. That was the hope. It would be, a, again, a, a conversation with the audience saying, here's this, here's this completely bonkers title. Um, and then you can choose to see it or not, too. It gives you so much information that you can, if that doesn't sound like it's for you, you know you don't need to, it, it <laughs> to gives, chase it down. It gives you a lot of information, but it can, only lead, it can also lead the audience in the wrong direction. Sure. It might like sell, sell it like a B-movie. or yep. And it's such a well-written movie, and it's such a deep movie with a deep character. Mm. Uh, are you not afraid that people would be, well... Uh, Mislead, misleaded by the, the title? It wasn't ever the intention to do that. I, you know, we talked about you know, changing the title all across the, the whole project. Um, no one ever pitched a better title and nobody really wanted to change it. And whenever we had kind of a simpler title, it felt like now you're forcing the audience to back into these stranger elements rather than just confronting them right off the bat. So I think one way or the other, you're, you're playing with the audience's perception. So just which way do you want to play with them? So yeah, it, it wasn't ever meant to be a, a trick. But on some level, it was, it was, we, we knew that there would be an expectation and that if you trust your audience, hopefully they trust you. And so we, we hope that as the movie progressed, they, we, would, we would earn their willingness to adjust their expectations. And I don't blame anybody if they don't want to. Uh, if, if, if I may say this, uh, for a young director, the movie has like very mature uh, concerns, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the theme of the movie is quite uh, deep and mature for a young director. That's quite unusual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think it was a lot of the things I was worried about at the time. My wife and I had lost a couple of people that were dear to us. My brother had just gotten in a terrible car accident and I had just begun writing it. And like I said, it was kind of this pulpy James Bond thing I wanted to do. And it just changed completely. I started thinking about a, an older person looking back with regret rather than a young person looking forward with hope. But I still wanted to find some hope by the end because these are the things I was, I was feeling at the time. And I think my biggest fear is kind of the secret antagonist of the movie, which is um, loss and um, feeling alone and so that's that's what I was really thinking about when I was writing it so I think it just came it wasn't so much it's just the things that were happening in life informed what it wound up being so yeah. when I saw the movie the, the first time I was thinking about another iconic figure and to me, the movie kind of really relates to Gran Torino. Yeah, well, I love Clint Eastwood. I yeah. mean, I love Unforgiven, and yeah. I like 
flawed characters, you know, his character study is about flawed people. And I think Gran Torino is a great example of that. He's kind of racist and he's, he's impatient and he's lonely and he's looking for connection and he finds it in a really strange way uh, through his car and through his neighbors. And in Unforgiven, it's this exploration of someone tortured by their violent past and having to re-embrace it. And I think Hitler and Bigfoot is very much about somebody that's tortured by a violent past and they're being forced to confront it once again. So there's a, definitely a connection to the types of stories that Clint Eastwood's been telling for some years. I, I, I mean, I, he's a hero of mine. Exactly, so, yeah. but mixed with some elements of pop culture. Sure, yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Some of my favorite directors and movies are peppered throughout this movie. Just, it's all kind of in the, in the DNA there of this weird thing. Okay, well, now the, our audience is going to discover the movie tonight. Mm -hmm. And, well, I think they're going to have a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for your answers. Thank you. Thanks for having me.